Sister Sharon, starting today, just let her know if you're interested in us ordering one of those books for you. Pastor, if you would grab that, order one of those books for you. Um, we will do that, and uh, I encourage you to, uh, Damon, if you could get my table, and you have my, my pen. Um, if you would order that book, greatly me appreciate it. Had some questions this week, too, just real quick, a couple of housekeeping things about a portfolio. Why is Pastor, why is Pastor Webb talking about portfolio for leadership, for um, our pastoral track? Well, maybe you weren't here, or possibly you just didn't pay attention. But I kind of let it go for a little while. But back when we first started the ministry track, I handed you a portfolio and said, bring it to church. I have not seen very many of these floating around this church. Now, my son is carrying his today only because he knows that I was going to get on him. <laughs> but that doesn't count. I'll love him for doing it, but that doesn't count. You should have had your portfolio with you. In this portfolio should be notes from my sermons. And, and let me just say this. I, I want to thank the Lord for um, those of you who pay attention to what I'm preaching. Uh, in, these, in these portfolios should be notes from my sermons. In these portfolios should be things that God is saying to you during service. In these portfolios should be a hot sermon in case I walk up to you on a Sunday morning and say, you're preaching today. You say, well, that probably won't happen. It probably won't, but what if it does? Amen. Amen. And, and so I encourage you to do that. I also want to thank the Lord for Sister Corey. Um, she texts me, and she tells me about my sermon. Hey, I really love what you preached about. And so I thank God for that. It's not a critique of my sermon. She's not mad about something I preach. She just <laughs> texts me and says, hey, Pastor, you know, the Apple thing, great. Uh, I appreciate that. I know she's paying attention, and more than the text, the fact that she's paying attention is, is a real blessing. And so I want to encourage you who are in the ministry track. I'm not going to give you an attaboy or atta girl because you should have already had this portfolio with you. If you have had it with you and it's been in hiding, I'll give you credit for that But because I know you would not tell me the truth, those who are in the ministry track. But... Uh, uh, I know you would not not tell me the truth, um, but uh, would like to see you carrying that with you. All of you who are in the ministry track should be carrying this portfolio. From this Sunday on, I may stop and ask you, where's your portfolio? You say, well, Pastor, what's the big deal about carrying it? It's about consistency. It's about obedience. It's about preparation. Amen? should always be prepared. The Bible says be instant in season and out of season. And tells us to always be prepared to give a answer to the hope that lies within us. So for ministers, that means you should have a sermon ready all the time. Because you never know when God is going to give you an opportunity to share that sermon. Remember uh, me talking and saying that God is preparing. I was speaking to a certain minister in this church from the platform and saying God preparing is preparing for that person, the audience. God prepares for all of us an audience. He is always preparing people to hear what he has to say through us and through our ministry. And that's also for the laymen in our church. Those of you who are just, you know, I'm just a Christian pastor. I'm not a preacher. You're, you're not a preacher, but you're a witness. God has called us to witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. And God will prepare people to hear that from you if you're willing to share it. Amen? Amen. You would turn with me to the book of Acts, and we're going to start there. Thank you. Um, great worship this morning, Pastor. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know the name of the song, but there was a particular song that you sang this morning that I want to use in our altar service. Um, thank you. There we go. That's why I love you. You can read my mind. In order to be the minister of music in this church or the worship leader, you have to be able to read the pastor's mind. Uh, yeah, you just you just hang on for just a second. Yes, sir, and thank you for reminding me because I would have forgotten. How many of you followed the instructions from last week? Now, now, Damon, I love you dearly, but I know I gave you a black marker. Where's my black marker, man? No, I didn't. <laughs> I said if you can find an extra one. There we go. I thought you lost it, man. I was really getting ready to get on you. And we're streaming live, too, boy. <laughs> How many of you remembered your seats? 
If you remember your seeds, hold them up. Although I did say a plastic bag. Huh? It's on your website. You should have. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just giving you a hard time. Um, if you didn't, it's okay. Um, you, can, you can still do this at home this week. It's not a big deal. It's not something necessarily you have to do here today. But let me just see one more time. Did you bring your seeds? Okay. Oh, so the dog ate your seeds? Is that what you're saying? Along with his paper and his portfolio? I was going to say, you might want to take that dog to the vet. How many of you have your seeds one more time? Okay, thank you for bringing them. Okay, I, I want you to hang on to them. And, and this is what I want us to do, too. And it, it doesn't necessarily, it's not just a this Sunday thing. I want you to hang on to these for the rest of the year. Because they're going to be a reminder to us that in my hand, and this is what I want you to remember, hold your seeds up. Those who have them, hold your seeds up. Okay? Those who don't, it's okay. Just hold your hand up. Okay? In my hand is my future potential. This is it. This is the seed. It doesn't matter about the apple. See, the apple is going to, it's going to rot. It's going to turn brown. But inside the apple is my future. See, we always, we always focus on the blessing. Okay, wow, man, I, I'm cultivating and I'm growing and I pick the apple. But see, if you're a farmer, you're not thinking just about the apple. Once the apple's off the tree, now you're thinking about next season. You're thinking about next harvest. And I think many times our pursuit of a blessing keeps us from thinking about what God wants to do even greater in our future. So in, as for me, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but out of one apple, I got five seeds. Wouldn't the enemy love for us just to focus on one apple and forget about the five seeds? Amen? Amen? And that's how we do sometimes. We, we petition God, petition God, petition God, and then once God does it, we just focus on the blessing and forget the seed that's there. In your hand is the potential of what God wants to do in the rest of your year, in the next two years, in the next five years. I, I was sitting down yesterday. Uh, turn with me, actually. Let me get you there. Acts chapter... Forgive me, I am. Acts chapter 11, and we'll be looking at 25 to 30, and we're going to be jumping around in some scripture this morning, so just, just stay with me. Uh, Pastor Rowe, did we hand out those? Uh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Now, now listen, I was sitting down with young ministers yesterday. I was doing um, interviews for CAMS, and, uh, you know, they come in, and it's their first time that they are at CAMS class, and uh, CAMS is a is an affirmation course to really help you decide whether you are in, called to ministry or not. And as those couples came in and sat down, as some of them were single in front of me, and as I began to interview them, I asked everybody one thing. I asked everybody one thing. I said to them that outside of your relationship with God, outside of your relationship with God, the most important thing you can do as a, as a minister is vision cast. If you can't cast vision, you're not going to be very effective. And this is what I mean. I spend very little time in today. I'm always thinking about tomorrow. Now, I can enjoy today and appreciate today, but in just a few hours, today's going to be yesterday. I'm, I'm vision casting is about tomorrow. It's where God is taking me. Remember I said last week when you begin to plow those uh, a field, and we're not talking about with tractors and what have you. We're talking about with a, a horse and, a, and a, just a plowshare. You're never plowing those fields, and you look down that plow row, and those, those furrows are so straight. And, and remember what I said. I said when you talk to someone who is... Uh, when you talk to someone who is plowing, you ask them, how do you get those things so straight? Because if I was doing it, everything would tail off to the right. I just know it would. And so I, my, mine would look like a striped shirt. And so how do you get those things so straight? They said, you, well, when you start at this end of the field, you pick a spot on the other end and you just watch that. And, and that makes a lot of sense. That's how I stay straight. It's how you keep the furrow straight. Well, that's vision casting. 
When you get to a place that you're beginning to plow up the field that God has for you, you keep your eyes on Christ. That's how you keep it straight. But how you, when you do that, you have to remember you're always thinking about up what's up there. You're not worried about what's under your plowshare. You, you're not necessarily worrying about the ox as long as he's behaving himself. You're, you're paying attention to the other end of the field, and that's your mark. I think there are, the enemy would love to get our eyes off the mark. He would love to get us to stop focusing on where God is taking us. And so I was sharing with these young ministers, you have to be a vision caster. If you can't cast vision, it's hard to do ministry. But I want to translate that down this morning to us as Christians. If you're not able to cast vision in your life, if you're just, let me just tell you something. I have met Christians that are continuously, they just live in today. It's just, what has God done today? What is God going to give me today? How am I going to get through today? And, and many times, every day, it's just about today. God doesn't want us focused just on today. He wants to pay attention to tomorrow. Some of us in our lives need to pick that spot, and that spot happens to be Jesus. We need to place our eyes on Christ. We need to get, see, that's why our lives aren't straight. You, you ever talk about people who say, you ever talk to people who say, well, you know, when I get myself together, I'm going to come to church when I get myself together. Pastor, I'm going to do a better job when I get myself together. Now, Christians don't say that. This is how Christians say it when my ship comes in. You know, when my ship comes in, Pastor, I'm going to take care of you. Pastor, when my ship comes in, you've got it made. Man, I tell you, I've been out there on the dock looking for some folks' ship. Amen? I, as a matter of fact, I was out there one day looking for my ship, and Sister Sweeney came in in a rowboat. Amen? But you know what? If I compare that rowboat to a dinghy, it was pretty big. Amen? It's all relative. But that's what Christian folks say. You know, when the Lord blesses me, when the Lord, and I've had people tell me this multiple times. Some of you in here have said it to yourself or to your family or to your friends. You know, when the Lord blesses me, when my blessing comes, can I tell you something? That's not having your eyes on the point. See, that when people say, when my ship comes in, when people say, when my blessing comes, when people say, when I'm going to get myself together, I'm going to come to church, that means your life is not straight. Amen? That means your life is not straight. Because the thing that you have to remember about a straight life is I know that I am never together. How do I know I'm never together? Because I'm always looking at Jesus and I can't measure up. So I'm not looking to get together. I'm looking to get to Jesus. I'm not waiting for my ship to come in. I'm trying to get to where Jesus is. I'm not waiting for Jesus to bless me. I'm trying to get where he is. See, many times, and Tommy Tenney talks about this in his book, The God Chasers, many times we are looking for God's hands. We want God to bless us. We want God to do this. But God, I, I want to show you some. Come here, Brother Edgar. Whenever we're worrying about hands, we're like this. You, you see what I'm saying? So, so if, if Edgar wants to know what's in my hand, this is about as close as we can get. God wants us to close the gap. He wants us to forget about his hands and pay attention to his face. In other words, some of us spend our entire life like this with God. But God's saying to us, I want you to close the gap. See, I want you to get it straight. I want you to understand that, that there's a point beyond where you are. That's why, thank you, Pastor, that's why our ship never comes in. That's why we never get straight. That's why we are always looking for that blessing because we haven't closed the gap. What is that gap? Once you get past the hands and you get that gap closed, that's called intimacy. That's intimate. You're being intimate with God. And so I want us to remember that this morning as we read in Acts chapter 11. This is what it says, verses 25 to 30. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a, whole year, that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. And in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the spirit that there should be great dearth throughout the world. That word dearth, as uh, Sister Val read to you this morning from the Amplified Version, is famine. A great dearth throughout the world, which came, which came to pass, excuse me, in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. 
which also they did and sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. Now, I want to tell you what this passage of Scripture is talking about. See, we're talking about, you know, digging furrows and planting and watering and reaping. Okay, but I want to tell you what this passage of Scripture is. Right here is when you see the, the farmer transition to a steward. Amen? It's when the farmer transitions to a steward. See, you're not always a farmer. Once the crop comes in, and that's why we have the apples and the seeds. See, see the apple is a representation of the farmer, but the seed represents the steward. And see, we're real good at the farmer part. We're real good at consuming the apple, but we many times discard the seed. And so what we want to focus on is not the farmer, but on the steward. Now, I want you to see how this happens. They had all of the things that had happened, all the good things, all the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the Gospels going out and all of those things that are happening early on in Acts. Here we are in Acts chapter 11, and now uh, it's prophesied that a, uh, a famine is going to come in the land. And so how does the church handle that? Because it's important for us to understand as to how we handle it today. Okay? There should not be, in theory, there should not be anyone in our church who is wanting it, in theory, okay? God never intended, now, now, listen to what I'm saying. I am not preaching against social services or welfare, any of this. That's not what I'm saying. It's not what I'm saying, okay? So don't, don't twist it around. I'm just talking about the church and our responsibility and what God intended. This is the New Testament church in the book of Acts. And so in the book of Acts, when there was going to be a famine in the land and Jerusalem was going to suffer, we hear how they handled that. It says, and then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea. Determined to send relief unto the brothers that dwelt in Judea. What they're talking about is money. That, that is exactly what they're talking about. Now, I'm not preaching about money today, but if we're talking about stewardship, we have to talk about resources, okay? Uh, can you guys throw up on our screen um, our, our new uh, mission statement? Is, is that possible? Not, not just as you go. Ye yell at me when you get it. So, so they're talking about resources. But when you're talking about resources and you're talking about planting and reaping and all of that, all of that was created by God. Genesis. I caught Pastor Burrell off guard. He's been asking me, am I reading? And I keep saying no, and then all of a sudden. To win? To win. I'm not asking you, sir. I'm just, shall not cease. In other words, God says it will continue eternally. Amen? In this world. And in the world to come is how I'm going to see it. But God, God said it wouldn't cease. And so God created the processes of planting and reaping. It was his idea. And he says it's going to continue. So we have to understand that it, it is not optional. If you're going to ask God for a blessing, then, then the other side of that is stewardship. You're going to have to be a steward with what he's giving you. There's some seed that's going to be connected with your blessing. You, you can't get a raise and not tithe on that raise. Amen? You can't do it because what you're doing is consuming the apple and squandering the seed. Okay? You, you can't get a raise and not give tithe. You can't get a job. You, you can't get a promotion on your job. Let's get off money for a second. You can't get a promotion on your job that says, oh, wow, you have every Friday free and just spend that Friday in bed. Amen? Because that Friday you should be here. Or you should be doing something for the Lord. You should be doing something in ministry all day. No, but a part of the day. See, because you're squandering the seed. We, we have to remember, once you stop being a farmer, you start being a steward. Luke chapter 12, we're going to get there in a minute. Jesus himself lets you know what he thinks about stewardship. But, but I want to show you something real quick. We, we get very upset when we talk about money. We get very upset when we talk about resources. But let me read something to you, okay? 
Have you ever wondered why I'm reading something from Dr. Raymond Culpepper, who was a former general overseer of the Church of God? He says, have you ever wondered why stewardship focuses on money? There's a good reason for this. Crown Financial Ministry says, a mater- uh, that says that money and material resources are mentioned in the Bible over 2,300 times. Prayer is mentioned 500, faith is mentioned 250, repentance 70, and baptism 20. So let me ask you a question, what interests God? Okay, and, and let's, not, let's not just say money, resources, period, amen? So it's not just what you own, it's what you can do. It's not just your money, it's your time. It's not just your time, it's your talent. It's not just your talent, it's your ability. See, what I'm saying is is that vision casting is not just for preachers, but God tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered of God. And so we have to understand that God, let me just say this to you this morning, God is taking you somewhere. Now, you may not be willingly going, you may be wandering off the track, but God has a desire to take you somewhere. And he wants you to arrive at where he's taking you with your seed in your hand because this signifies your heritage and how he wants to bless you. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yelling, cl- name it, claim it, and frame it. Oh, you want to be a millionaire? God will make you a millionaire because Jesus talks about millionaires over here in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 12, and we'll read that in a minute. I'm not talking about that. Many times our offerings don't equate in a financial gain, do they? But I would ask you this morning, as you look around our world, um, how much would Right now, how much would the world pay for peace? How much would the world pay for peace right now? I was watching a documentary the other day. You know how scripture says that that God owns a cattle on a thousand hills? You know how God God says the gold is mine and the silver is mine? You know how it says that in, in, in in the prophets? It said the gold is mine, the silver is mine. You know, Brother Virgil, that's one of his great, great places he likes to talk about. Well, I learned something about that this week. I learned something about that this week. It, and, and I was sitting down watching a documentary. Man, watch the History Channel. Watch, watch, the, uh, you know, watch National Geographic. In between all the nonsense, sometimes you get some good stuff. But I was watching. Where was I watching? Um, Discovery. Watching Discovery. Now, remember, God says the gold is mine, the silver is mine. Okay, God owns a cattle on a thousand hills. We all know, let me just say, we all know that God's rich, right? Okay, we all know that. And I, I found that out this week. Somebody tell me, on the earth right now, what is the most precious stone that there is on the earth right now? What is it? Anybody know? Diamond? Not just the diamond. What kind of diamond? Anybody know the name of it? The Hope Diamond. Man, that thing is huge. Thing is huge. Uh, I was also watching um, uh, the the Learning Channel some the other day, and it was uh, um, it was um, the the thing about the two hillbillies that that they do stuff in the mountains. They never buy anything. Reminds me of my dad. They never buy anything. They always just rig stuff up. It's called hillbilly blood. You know, if you've seen it on cable. Okay? And, and you guys say, well, you know, Pastor, that's, you know, I actually have time to watch that and do my studies. What do you do? All right? What do you do? As a matter of fact, those in the ministry class, how far have you read in your books or you didn't read at all because we weren't meeting? So I have time to do that and read. Okay? But this is what they did. These two hillbillies went out. They see, one thing you have to know about, learn about, even in this, this movie, uh, this show, this silly show, I'm learning about, our, our, uh, about the world. In the mountains of Appalachia, some of the richest, or some of the richest veins of rubies and amethyst and all of that in the world. Okay? And so these guys go out and they make this little hillbilly sleuth and they're, you know, sleuthing these rocks and they get this one rock and it just looks like something I would throw across the, the river, to, you know, to, to skip it. And, and he goes, no, nah, man, I, I've been around long enough. I know that this is something. Let me just say this, make a long story short. They take this rock to a dealer, this little thing that they got out of this creek 
in Appalachia, once it's cut stone, it was a ruby. Okay? Once it was cut, it was worth $10,000. Once it was cut. And you know how, now this is really cool. I'm not going to preach this because I could. It's going to be very difficult for me not to preach this. You know how you could tell it was a ruby? You ready for this? How the light shone through it. He put a light up to it, and what it looked like on the other side is how he knew it was a ruby and that it was a good one. How often does the light of Jesus Christ shine through us and people know how authentic we really are? Amen. But I'm going to let that go. I'm going to let that go. I'm not even charging for that, okay? Not even charging for that. Some of you are saying, I wouldn't pay you for anything you say, but, you know. Now, now watch this. You know the most expensive rocks on the face of the earth right now? They are worth $32 million. Anybody know what they are? Yes. Moon rocks. You go, girl. Moon rocks. When the Apollo mission went to the moon, they're not, they're not, they're not worth all that money because they're moon rocks. They're worth all that money because of their mineral content. These rocks are worth $32 million. Can I tell you something? This is my point. God has a whole solar system full of that stuff. That's the point I'm making. God has a whole solar system full of that stuff. He's not interested in our money. You know why he talks to us about resources? Because he knows that's what interests us. Amen? Because that's what interests us. God's surrounded by nice stuff. The reason he, he says what he says to us is because he's interested, he knows we're interested in that. And so God, 2,300 times in Scripture, talks about resources and finances. And so when you're talking about resources and finances, and I'm saying all of our resources, when we're talking about resources and finances, okay, seed. This represents our resources and our finances. How many people sit on the pew and don't use their resources and their finances for the Lord? And let's just get off finances for a minute. How many people sit on the pew and don't use their resources for the Lord? I want to challenge you this morning and ask you a question because this is a series that's ongoing, so I don't have to be hurrying and getting through it. So I want to stop and ask you a question this morning. I want you to take some stock in yourself right now. Right now. What can you do? And are you doing it for God? Let, let me ask on this side. What do you do? And are you doing it for the Lord? And when you measure it out, when you measure it out, when you put it on the scale, is what God has done for you, does it even measure up to what you've done for God? See, that's why God talks about resources. Because he says that wherever a man's heart is, or wherever a man's treasure is, that's where his heart is. Wherever his heart is, that's where his treasure is. And so those are interchangeable desires. And so we have to understand that God is wanting us to realize that our seed represents our heritage. It represents our blessing. It represents vision. It represents what God wants to do in your life. It represents where God wants to take you. It represents how God wants to manifest itself in your life. And so when you hold your seed in your hand, whether that's your finances, whether that's your talent, whether that's your ability, I want to ask you a question this morning. This is Valentine's Day. What is commanding your heart? What is commanding your heart? What is taking your attention? What is your focus on? You know, a lot of times we hear people say, you know, well, I'm focused on my children. I'm focused on my spouse. I'm focused on my job. I'm focused on my finances. I'm focused on this or I'm focused on that. Whatever you put, let me just say this to you before we move into Luke. Whatever you put before God, you have automatically cursed. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Whatever you place in front of God, you've now cursed. And so if you place your money in front of God, you've cursed your money. If you place your family in front of God, you've cursed your family. Now let me stop right here and clarify. You never put your family behind the church. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying to you that if God has called you to do something and you use your children as an excuse not to do it, eventually you are cursing your children because you're saying to God, I'm going to, let me just tell you this. Not, one of the things that really irk everybody about the, the terrorists is that they hide behind innocent people. 
So we're going to hide in this city, and you won't bomb this city because you'll kill all these innocent people. Can I tell you something? Christians have been doing that for millennia. We always hide behind uh, our, our children. We hide behind our family. We hide behind responsibility. Jesus even shares in a parable that the, the master went out to have, wanted to have a feast. Oh, no, I've got to buy an oxen. Oh, no, I've got to go check a field. Oh, no, I need, even when Jesus called people, oh, I've got to go home and bury my parents. Oh, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. We're always shielding ourselves with pretend responsibility and, because we don't want to do what God's called us to do. And so the question this morning on Valentine's Day is what can Commands your heart. We're talking about your seed. We're talking about your resources. What commands your heart? Can, can I tell you something? Can I tell you something? You know what I love about God? And that's why today is important. Hold your seed up. You know what else seed says to us? If you don't have your seed, just in your mind do it. Because you got it at home. Though you, you guys have it. Okay. You know what your seed represents? And I want you to get this good. Of everything I say this morning, I want you to get this. You know what your seed represents? A new beginning. See, God is, God is, is a God of new beginnings. Man. You know, I was reading this week in, in, in the Bible, uh, in the, um, I believe it was Exodus. I was reading this week, and, and God has given Moses all these commands for the children of Israel. Okay, don't do this, do this, don't do this, do this. Something jumped out at me. God has a timetable for servants to be set free. He said, after seven years, when you get to the seventh year, let them go. Okay, it wasn't optional. He had a time for the servants to be set free. He had a time for the land to rest. He has a time. The Bible says it to everything is a time and a season. You know, God has a time for you for a new beginning. See, your seed represents that new beginning. Okay, if you don't want to think about heritage and you don't want to think about resources, you want to think about it, think about this, new beginnings. Every once in a while, we all need a restart, don't we? Something happens in our lives. Some situation comes up. We go through a tough time. Look, I don't know about the rest of you guys, but, but and you guys know what I'm talking about. My family and I are in war right now. We are at war right now with the enemy. And, and he is attacking my family with everything he has, it seems like. And so when this, when this battle is over, I'm going to want to restart. Amen? I, I'm going to want some newness. I'm going to want something fresh. How many of you have walked out of your house in the morning on a nice, clear day and just, oh, man, that's something about that fresh, that fresh morning. Okay, God is a God of restarts. He's a guy that any man who is in Christ is what? A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. God loves restarts. He loves to give people another chance. He loves to give people second and third and fourth and fifth chances. Peter said, how often should we forgive someone seven times? He's now seven times 70. And they were talking daily, by the way. And so we have to understand, God's a God of restarts. My seed represents a new day. It represents something new happening. That's why vision is important, because when I'm in the midst, see, if you're a person of vision, when I'm in the midst of this trial and tribulation, I'm not just looking at this. I know where I'm going, and God is encouraging me. It's kind of like the battle. In, it's kind of like the battle that they went through in the Old Testament. Moses went up on the hill, and as long as Moses' hands were up and they could see Moses, they were winning. But but whenever Moses' hands went down, and you know why Moses' hands were up to be visible. Okay, as soon as Moses wasn't as visible, the battle went the way of the enemy. But as soon as he was visible again, the battle went the way of, of Israel. There are times when in the midst of the battle, the thing that, does, that, that really blesses us, our vision keeps Jesus in sight. As long as I can see him, then I'm okay. As long as I know that this is for the glory of the Lord, it's okay. As long as I know that he's still there, high and lifted up, I'm okay. That's why the Bible tells us, look unto the hills from whence cometh your help. See, he's in an elevated position. But can I tell you something? In order for Jesus to be in that elevated position, you have to put him there. You have to put him there. So right now, even though my family and I are going through one of the toughest battles that we've ever encountered in our lives, I still can see Jesus in all of this. And so our seed reminds us that, and vision reminds us that we're going somewhere. 
You know what happens to people? You, you know why I, I, I hear this all the time? Matter of fact, again, on TV the other day, I only watched about five minutes of it. They were saying, they were talking about the, um, the tragic face behind comedy. And it went through all of these comedians and how these guys would stand up night after night in front of people and make them laugh and how tragic their lives actually were. Ultimately committing suicide. I won't use names. One, one comedian gets up one morning and, and, and he, he is suffering from depression like you wouldn't believe. It had only been identified a few weeks in his life. He gets up one morning, he's goofing off with his girlfriend, they're playing around, goofing, having a good time. He says to her, hey, uh, I'd like to have some pancakes. Would you go down and make me some pancakes? She says, sure. So they goof around for, you know, kid each other, tease. She heads down the steps. By the time she gets to the kitchen, she hears, bang. He put a gun in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Whether it was by suicide, by drugs, that, that's what I'm asking you. What would the world give for peace? What would they pay for peace? See, what the enemy wants to do in our lives, and you could sit here and pretend like you have it all together. That's your business. That's your business. Pastor Bro, I may not get to all those scriptures today, but I feel like the Holy Spirit's taking me another way. You may be sitting here and you say, hey, I got this all together. Yeah, or, or you may be wanting us to think that. You may be wanting us to think that. Let me just tell you this. I see this over and over and over again in the lives of ministers. That you go ahead and keep your fight a secret. Okay? You go ahead and do that. Because it's going to kill you. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to kill you. You don't think that I've had people say to me, I've had ministers try to inquire to me, you know, your family's going through all this right now. Why are you telling everybody? Why wouldn't I? I don't want to fight this by myself. Are you crazy? I stand in front of close to 100 people every Sunday who pray, and I'm not going to ask you to pray. Is that crazy? But that's how the enemy is. Don't tell anybody. You know, don't, don't tell anybody. You, you, you don't want to embarrass yourself. And I've seen, I've seen ministers for years hide things from their congregation. I've, I've, Sister Winnie and I have seen ministers on their deathbed dying of disease, and the church is not coming over to pray with them. They're not allowed to come because they need their rest. Just saw a text message earlier this week about one of the one of the stalwart leaders of our church who went to the hospital in grave condition, and the first thing the family says is, "Don't visit him. Give us our time." Really? Give you what time? Doesn't the Bible say that in the over in the book of James doesn't say if there are any sick among you, call for the elders of the church. Doesn't it tell us to confess our sins one to another from, from Wednesday night? Doesn't it tell us that, doesn't it give us the parable of the, the, the man who's walking down the, the road, the Samaritan, and he sees the, the Jew on the side of the road beat up and stops and helps him when his own people wouldn't? You know what that represents to me? We have folks in the church who will go to work and tell all their business but won't come and ask for prayer. And that's a trick of the enemy. I'm not going to do this alone. That's not the will of God. I'm not going to stand before God later and say, well, look what happened to me. And God said, well, it didn't need to. How often do we say, God, where are you? How often do we say that to God? And, and how often would God's response be, I'm right there. Well, I didn't see you. Well, last Sunday, my name was Denise. Where were you at, God? Oh, last Sunday, my name was Tori. Where were you at, God? Last Sunday, my name was Obi. Where were you at, God? Well, Thursday night, I was on the prayer line. My name was Robert Burrell. 
We have the audacity to ask God, where is he? I'm there. He said, well, Pastor, you don't understand. I like my business to be my business. And you don't understand. That's exactly how the enemy likes it. That's exactly how he likes it. You know, you know when our seed is most vulnerable? When it's in our hand. You don't think the enemy's trying to steal your future from you right now? You don't think the enemy right now is plotting on how he can make you miserable? You don't think right now, don't look at me and what's going on with my daughter. You don't think the enemy's plotting against your kids right now? You think he's not? You better look at my family and say, but for the grace of God, there go I. My, my, my struggle, our family struggles. What's going on in our family isn't because we weren't faithful to God. It's not because we weren't good parents. I refuse to not be, to be called because uh, I wasn't a good parent. I'm a good father. I'm a good husband. I'm a good pastor. Okay? It's not because of that. It's because the enemy goes around as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And when we declared a year of harvest, he declared war. It's that simple. And why in the world would I stand before God and say, God, I need your help, and yet not in, entail or include the people of God? When God has told me over and over and over, if you need prayer, go to church. If you need prayer, call a brother. If you're struggling, share it with a brother. If you have a problem, share it with a sister. I've given you that. We are surrounded, even in Hebrews, when you die, it says you're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. God has given us one another. Yet we come to church on Sunday or on Wednesday or once a month or once a year, whenever we do, and we sit there and want to pretend like everything's okay. I'm here to tell you, you need to close. Close the gap between what God can do and being intimate with him and begin to call on him and have those prayer warriors around you who will be, be there with you and answer and, and be the one who will help you through the process. See, I had a lot of things to say this morning. We're, we're going we're gonna to do the book of Luke next week. We'll talk about what Jesus thinks about stewardship next week. You know when God spoke to me about the new beginnings thing, the, the God of new beginnings? He spoke to me. That, that was the piece he added to my sermon last night and then this morning. We need a new beginning. Some of us just need a fresh start. And I'm not talking about redo your whole life. I'm talking about your relationship with Christ, the battle that you're going through, the situation you're struggling with. Some of you, your, your apples have rotted, and your blessing is a far-flung memory. But I just want to tell you something. If you pulled out the seed, the seed's still good. And you'll see as the year goes on, it might dry up, but it'll still be intact. God is waiting for you. He, he wants to give you a fresh start. He wants to give you a new beginning. You know, and, and God, even in all that I shared with you about the seven years, in the, in the 50th year, the year of Jubilee, everything was forgiven. If you sold your land, you got your land back. And what I mean by that is if your land was taken, you had to sell it for a debt, you got your land back. Now, I want you to get this. You got your land back. If, if you were in slavery, you got out. In, in the year of Jubilee, this, this is the deal. In the year of Jubilee, everything was restored to you that you lost or, or to your family. Okay? It's your heritage. It's, the, it's, it's what God has given you. Can, can I tell you something? The, the year of Jubilee speaks to me, and the scripture that says, every man who's in Christ is a new creature. You know what that says to me, Pastor? That says to me that no matter how much I've squandered, God's going to give it back. You, you hear what I'm saying? Say, Pastor, you don't know where I've been. 
but I can tell you where you're going. Because where you've been has no bearing on where you're going. Because any man who is in Christ is a new creature. And so on any given day, Pastor Burrell, I can get out of bed and decide, this is the day that I'm going to deploy my seed. See, because it's in my possession. Remember what we talked about last year? What can we control? We control the process. Well, planting is the process. So on any given day, uh, any given day, Minister Bristol, I can get up and say, today's the day I plant my seed. Pastor Burrell, any given day, I can get up and say, today's my fresh start. Well, Pastor, I had a fresh start yesterday. Well, today's a good day for a new one. Because at some point, you'll get it right. You see what I'm saying? At some point, you'll get it right. If you could put together a string of fresh starts for about seven or 800 days, can you imagine where your life would be? Pastor, you're going to start fresh every day for 800 days. Man, that puts you several years into a relationship with God that you would, be, would know it's unbelievable. So our seed represents that. See, it, in, in other words, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how you've squandered your blessing, God says today, I'll give it all back. You hear what I'm saying? And, and this is where the Holy Spirit stopped me. I have no idea why the Holy Spirit stopped me here, but we're going to stop right there. Today, I'll give it all back. Uh, will the ushers come and just move this table? Damon, I apologize, sir, to you, but God doesn't want us doing that today. We're going to do something else. Let me just talk to you. Those of you who are here, I'm your pastor. I'm going to talk to you as your pastor. Those of you who are here, that I'm just a minister to you. Let me just talk to you as a pastor, as a minister. You're going, to come, you, you're going to come to a place, and you may already be there, where how you're doing it is not going to work. You may already be there today. You may, may be here in this church, and this may be one person, but man, I know that the Holy Spirit is stopping me right now. It's like zero to 60, back to zero. You may be here today, and everybody thinks, wow, you've got it all together, or wow, she's okay, or he's okay. There is, any, let me say it this way. You ever go down to the Potomac River? You know, look at the Potomac River. Specifically where it's narrower, okay? And you look at that river, man, it's like, well, it's just moving water. You know how people drown in the river? They don't pay attention to what's underneath. You get in the wrong spot on the Potomac River, it doesn't matter how strong a swimmer you are, you're going to die. Because the undercurrent, that undertow will just suck you in. People die every year. That's what some of you are. That's what some of us are. We're like the Potomac River. Man, we look smooth on top. Oh, they're moving forward. Oh, yeah, that's, they, they're looking good. But underneath, it's a raging torrent. We are fighting with all we have to keep our head above water. We're struggling against the current. We have folks in our church who could use a fresh start, could use something different to happen, could use not being in the midst of the struggle. Let me just tell you this. By Sister Sweeney and I coming forward to the church and sharing our struggle, you guys have not let us down. The encouragement, the, the blessings that you've given us, even this morning, you know, Sister Britton comes to me and says, hey, there's something in the fridge for you. 
she knows that John and I are by ourselves, and uh, who knows what can happen. She felt like maybe she felt like she needed to intervene. But you know, if we hadn't told anyone, we hadn't said anything to anybody. I don't know that Sister Sweeney and I would still be standing. There's been several days that a couple of your phone calls have caught us. Oh, wait a minute, come on, get back up. You got this. And I wish that for you. There is no, let, let me just tell you, let me just say this to you. There is no badge of honor when you get to heaven because you did it alone. Okay, there's not a reward for that. I'm just going to tell you that. And the people who make it alone are the extremely small minority. Because most of them don't make it. God has given us one another. You know, there's even been a couple of times in my life when I feel like I've had to hand my seat off for good safekeeping because I wasn't in a, the state of mind or the state of spirit to properly disperse it. I'm not letting the enemy take it. I may have to, at, at some point in my life, some of you may be there, I may have to come to Corey and say, Corey, I need you to hang on to this for me. I'll come back and get it. Why? Because... Because, see, sometimes in the midst of a battle, I don't want to drop it. The enemy's trying to take it from me. So I know he has me distracted. I'm going to get it to someone where I won't be distracted. Okay? Someone who's not distracted. Someone say, hey, Pastor, I got this. Or, hey, Ed, I got this. Every time you go to a brother or sister, or you stand in front of this church and we gather around you, we're helping you protect your seed. We're helping you protect your heritage. I think there's some folks here in our church who need a fresh start, need a redo. We need a year seven or a jubilee year. I think there's some folks here that you're in the midst of a struggle and you haven't told anyone. I want to encourage you to come clean today. I'm not saying come up here and get the mic and tell everybody your business. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying step forward and say, man, I need you guys to gather around me. See, I could pray for you and not know what you want me to pray for. You, you understand what I'm saying? You and God know. All I need to do is stand there with you. See, I don't have to, I don't have to know why you're fighting. I just have to get in a fight. Amen. You know, if you go into any great war, and I've heard this time and time and time again, and, and I want to share this with you. And yes, I, I'm closing, so please help me out. I, I want to share this with you. How many of you are military or ex-military? So you guys are going to know what I'm talking about. Over and over and over again, especially since we have all the talk from, from Desert Storm and, and, and you know, Afghanistan and all that that's been going on past 20 years but you guys will I know you guys will verify this I've never been in the military but I've heard so many of these guys say it they'll get these guys on TV and interview them and interview them and interview them and, and, and to a man when they're in a foxhole or when they're in that that, hum, that Humvee when they're stuck on the side of a, of a hill or whatever when they're taking fire You and me in the United States of America is the last thing on those guys' mind. You know what's on their mind? The guy next to him. See, I'm not fighting for America at that point. I'm not fighting for an idea. I'm not fighting for a value. I'm not fighting for any of that. I'm fighting for him. Because I need him to have my back. So I got his. Am I right, guys? To a man. I've never heard him say anything else. Of course, I, I wasn't in the military. You guys were. But I hear every one of these guys say the same thing. They just had an interview on, on um, 
on Fox with uh, the guys who uh, were there at the, the embassy. And it, I mean, one of those guys, man, I mean, it's unbelievable. He took her around in the shoulder. He took her around the arm. His arm's hanging off. Why'd you keep pushing forward for these guys? Why were you guys continuing to fight for him? That's the whole no man left behind thing. See, when, when you're in the midst of a war, it's not about values. It's not about the country. It's, it's not even about, at that point, when you're in the middle of that conflict, Pastor Earl, it's not even about why we're fighting. You need me. I'm here. We're fighting. Because what you're fighting about isn't my main concern. My main concern is that you fight again you make it through this to fight another day because my outcome and this is this is the end of it here my outcome my outcome minister whistle is hanging on your outcome my outcome al is hanging on your outcome my outcome christine depends on your outcome so i'm gonna fight I don't need to know why I'm fighting. Tony, my outcome hangs on your outcome. If you don't make it, guess what? Next fight, I don't make it. Why? Because you're not there to have my back. If you become a casualty, I become a casualty. That's why Jesus uh, or, or the Holy Spirit so painstakingly spoke through Paul to call us the body and the toe and the arm and the ear and the eye. It, it's all important. So I ask you this morning, guys. Guys, gender neutral. Who needs us to get around you? Who needs a fresh start? And I'm not to see, every time you talk about this, everybody thinks sin, sin, sin. I'm not talking about sin. I'm talking about you're just tired. You've just been in it. It's been a tough time. I don't have any misconception that what my family and I are dealing with is because God's mad at us about something or because we've done some great sin. God hired me imperfect and been working on me ever since. It can't be that. When Jesus called me, he knew what he had. It can't be that. You're not where you are because God's angry with you or because God's trying to make a point to you. You're where you are because God loves you and you love God and that's the war that we fight. And if you're fighting it alone and you're wondering where God is, look around. He's sitting right here. The question is, do you, are you going to get his help? So as our wonderful minister of music begins to lead us this morning, we want to pray with you.